From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube, coming to you today from our Palo Alto studios. Um, it's COVID is still going on, so still no shows, but the good news is we got the technology, we can reach out to the community and bring them in from far, far away. So today joining us from Virginia across the country is David Scott. He is the director of product management for Veritas. David, great to see you. Thanks Jeff, great to be here. Absolutely. So let's, um, let's jump into it. You guys have been about backup and, and recovery for years and years and years. Um, but oh my goodness, how the, uh, how the landscape continues to evolve between you know, public cloud and, and you know, all the things happening with Amazon and, and Google and, and Microsoft, and then now, of course, big push for hybrid and you know, where are the workloads and kind of application-centric infrastructure. You guys still got to back up and secure all these things. I wonder if you can give us a little bit of your perspective on you know, kind of the increasing complexity of the computing environment as all these different kind of pieces of the puzzle all are kind of gaining traction uh, at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm on the compliance side of the uh, the company, so I'm more on um, looking after requirements around collection of content, preparation for litigation, um, making sure you're adhering to compliance regulations in different parts of the world. And I mean, that's a, a constantly evolving uh, space. Um, one of the, so basically the products I look after are Enterprise Vault, EnterpriseVault.cloud, and e-discovery platform. And as you say, I mean, one of the biggest challenges is that uh, customers are starting to move, you know, uh, customers are looking for flexibility in how they deploy our solutions. We've been, we've had a, a product in market for, with Enterprise Vault for about 20 years. And so we have a lot of customers that have a lot of data on premise, and now they're starting, you know, they've got cloud mandates. They want to move those that content to the cloud. So we have gotten very aggressive at building out our SaaS archiving solution, enterprisevault.cloud, but we also provide other options. Like if you want to move Enterprise Vault from your data center on premise to your tenant in Azure Amazon, we fully support that. In fact, we're taking advantage of cloud services to um, make that a, a much more viable option for, for our customers. So let's then get into the regulation and the compliance because that's that's a big piece of the motivation beyond just um, you know making sure that the business can recover. The the regula regulation and compliance thing is huge. You know the GDPR, which has been around now for a couple of years, California Protection Act, and I think what I find interesting from your perspective is you have this kind of crazy sea of regulations that are different by by country, by industry, by data type and they're evolving all the time. So that's got to be a, a relatively complex um, little little grid you got to keep track of. Yeah, it, it makes the job interesting, but it also is a huge competitive advantage for us. We have a team that researches data privacy regulations around the world, and it's been a competitive advantage in that we can be incredibly nimble in creating a new policy. We had some opportunities come up in Turkey. Uh, there's a re regulation there that mirrors GDPR called KVKK or Kabe Kaka, I think they call it locally. Um, and it's, uh, I joke, it's kind of like GDPR, but with jail time for non-compliance. So there's a lot more motivation on the part of a, an IT department to make sure they're, they're, they're meeting that requirement. But it has to do with dealing with you know, data privacy again and uh, ensuring the safety of, of the, that content. And that's proliferating throughout the world. You mentioned California Consumer Privacy Act. Many other states are starting to follow what, uh, you know, what, the, the consumer, California Consumer Privacy Act. And I'm sure it won't be long before we have a you know, data privacy act in the US that's nationwide instead of at the state level. Um, in other industries that we serve, like the financial services industry, there's, you know, there's always been a lot of regulation around SEC and FINRA in the U.S. That's spreading to other countries now. You know, MIFID II in the European Union has been huge, and that dictates you need to capture all voice conversations, all text conversations, instant messages, everything that goes on between a broker and uh, and the end customer has to be captured, has to be supervised, 
and has to be maintained on worm storage. So that's a great segment for us as well. That's a, an area we play very well in. So it's interesting because in, in preparing for this, I saw some of the recent announcements around the concept of data supervision. So I think a lot of people are familiar with, with backup and recovery um, and continuity, but specifically data supervision. What, is, what does that really mean? How is that different than kind of traditional backup and recovery? And what are some of the really key um, features or attributes to make that a successful platform? Yeah, no, it's, it is really outside of the, the realm of backup and recovery. Uh, it, archiving is very different from backup and recovery in that archiving is about preserving the communication and being able to monitor that communication um, for the purposes of meeting um, compliance regulations. So um, in the case of our solution, Veritas Advanced Supervision, it, it sounds a bit big brotherish, uh, if I'm being honest, but it, it, it is a requirement for the financial service community that you, you sample a subset of those communications looking for violations. So you're looking for insider trading, you're looking for money laundering. Um, in some companies at the HR departments are even just trying to ensure that uh, their, their employees are being compliant. And so you may sample a subset of content but it's absolutely required within the financial services community. And we're starting to see a lot of other uh, industries, you know, leveraging this technology just to ensure compliance with different regulations or compliance with their own internal policies, um, ensuring a, a safe workplace, ensuring that there's not you know, you know, sexual harassment or that type of thing going on through office communications. So it, it is a way of just monitoring um, your employees' communications. So it's wild. I remember when um, when people used to talk about messaging in kind of the generic sense, and I could never understand. You know, it's, it's an email, it's a text. I mean, little did I know that every single application that's now installed on every single device that I have has a messaging app. You know, has a direct messaging feature. So I mean, the complexity and and. I guess the, the variability in the communication methods across all these applications and you know probably more than half of them that most of us work on are SaaS as well, really uh, adds a ton of complexity to the, to the challenge that you were just talking about. Oh, absolutely, I mean, I, I, I'm old. I'm, I, you know, when I started, all of my communications were on a Microsoft mail server. All my files were in the file, you know, the server room down the hall. Now I've got about 20 different ways to communicate on my phone. And uh, the fragmentation of communication does make that job a lot more, more challenging. Um, you know, now you need to take a voice conversation, convert it to text. Um, with COVID and with um, you know, the, the dawn of telemedicine, um, or at least the, uh, the, the, the rapid growth in telemessaging, uh, telemedicine, sorry, uh, there is a whole new potential market for this kind of supervision tool. Now you can capture every doctor-patient interaction that takes place over Zoom or over uh, Teams video, transcribe that content, and there's a wealth of value in that conversation. Not only can you tell if the doctor is responding to the patient, if the interaction is positive or negative, is the doctor helping to calm the patient down? Do they have good quality of interaction? That sort of thing. And so there's incredible value in capturing those communications so you can learn from the well, you know, learn best practices, I guess. And then feed that into a broader data lake and correlate the interaction with patient outcomes. Who are your great doctors? Who are your, you know, that type of thing. So that's an area that we're very excited about going forward. Wow, that's pretty interesting. I never kind of thought that through because I, I would have has assumed that, you know, kind of most of the calls for this type of data were based on some type of a litigation, you know, it was some type of an ask or a request. And I was going to ask you, you know, how does that actually work within the context of this sea of data um, that you have? Is it usually around a specific individual who's got some issues and you're, you're kind of looking at their ecosystem of communications or is it more of a pattern or is it potentially more of a keyword type of thing that, that, that's triggering you know, kind of this forensics into this tremendous amount of data that's in all these enterprises? Yeah, it, it's a little bit of everything. Like, so first of all, we have um, the ability to capture a lot of different native content sources, but we also leverage partners to bring in other content sources. We can capture over 80 different content sources. All the you know, instant messaging, uh, social media, of course, email, uh, but even voice communications and video communications. Uh, and to answer your question, as far as litigation, I mean, it really depends on the incident, right? In the past, in the old days, any kind of litigation resulted in a fire drill where you're trying to find every scrap of evidence, every piece of information related to the case. 
by being a little bit proactive and capturing your email and your communication streams into immutable storage in an archive, you're ready for that litigation event. And you've already indexed that content. You've already classified that content so you can find the needle in the haystack. You can find the relevant content to prove your innocence um, or at least to comply with the request for information. Now, that has also led to uh, solving similar issues for public sector, U US federal with the Freedom of Information Act. They're getting all kinds of requests for right now for COVID related communications. And that could be related to lawsuits. It could be related to um, just information around how stimulus funds are being, being spent. And they've got to respond to these requests very, very quickly. Our team came up with a COVID-19 classification policy where we can actually weed out the communications related to COVID-19 to allow those federal agencies and even state and local agencies to quickly respond to those types of requests. So that's uh, that's been an exciting area for us. And then there's still the, the, the SEC requirements to monitor broker dealers and conversations with end users to ensure they're not doing anything they shouldn't be doing like insider trading. Right. Which is which is so different than kind of a post a post event you know kind of forensics investigation and then collecting that data. So I'm curious, you know, how often are you having to update update policies and and update you know kind of the the sniffers and the the intelligence that goes behind the monitoring to 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 trigger a flag and then does that just go into their own internal kind of compliance reg and set off a whole nother chain of events? I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things we can do with our classification policies. And like in the case of the COVID policy, we just kind of crowdsourced that internally and uh, created a policy in about a week, really, that we, you know, we, we shaped the basic policy and then kept refining it, refining it, testing it. And we were able to go from start to finish and have it publicly available within about a week and a half. It was really a, a great effort. And we have that kind of uh, ability to be very nimble to um, react to different different types of regulations as they they become you know get out there, and there, there's also a constant refining of even data privacy for every country that we support. You know we have data privacy regulations for the entire European Union and for most countries around the world, obviously the U.S., Canada, Australia, and so on. And um, you can always make those policies better. So we've introduced feedback loops where our customers can give us feedback on what works and what isn't working, and we can tweak the policies as needed. But it is a great way to respond to whatever is going on in the world to help our customer base, which um, you know is largely the financial verticals, the public sector verticals, uh, but even healthcare is, uh, is becoming more important for us. So David, I wonder if there's some other use cases that, that people aren't thinking about where you guys have seen value in, uh, in this type of analytics. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, the the one thing I think is just starting to emerge is the value that's inherent in communications. So I, I mentioned earlier the um, telemedicine idea, and you know, can you learn from doctor patient interactions if you're capturing them uh, over telemedicine vehicles? You know, again, video, chat, Zoom, and that sort of thing. Um, but similarly, if you've captured communications for a long time, as many of our customers have. What can you do with that data and how can it feed into a broader data lake to give you new insights? So for example, if you want to gauge whether a, a major deal is about to close, you know you can rely on your sales reps to populate the CRM and give you an indication it's 10% complete, it's 50% complete, whatever. But you're dependent on all the games that salespeople play. It would be far better to look at the pattern of a traditional deal closing. You know, first you start out with one person at your company talking to one person at the target customer. That leads to meetings, that leads to calendar invites, that leads to emails being sent back and forth. You can look at the time of response. How quickly does the target customer respond to the sales rep? How um, often are they interacting? How many people are they interacting with? Is it spanning different geos? Is it spanning different groups within the company? Um, are there certain documents being sent back and forth like a quote, for example? All of this can give you a higher confidence that that deal is going to close or that deal's failing. You don't really know. You can also look at historical data and compare the current account manager to his predecessor. You know, does the current account manager interact with his customer as much as the former rep did? 
And is there a correlation in their effectiveness, you know, based on kind of their interactions and their, their, their just basic skills? So I think that's an exciting field and it shines a new light on the, the data that you have to collect to comply with regulations, the data you have to collect for litigation and other reasons. Now there's other value there. Right, that's a fascinating story. So the reason that you guys would be involved in this is because you're sitting on, you're sitting all that, all that comms data because you have to for the regulation. I mean, what you're describing sounds like a perfect, you know, kind of Salesforce uh, plug-in um, with Absolutely. a much richer data set versus, as you said, relying on the salesperson to input the Salesforce information, which would require them to remember their password, which gets reset every three weeks. So the chances of that are pretty slim. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, there's a fact, I think I, I read a stat recently that about you know, only 10% of information is actually captured in a CRM. Um, you know, contact information and that sort of thing. But if you're looking at their emails, if you're looking at their phone calls and their texts and that sort of thing, you get a rich set of data on contacts and people that you're interacting with at a target customer. And, you know, sales, if, if more than any other job, I think sales has high turnover. And so you you need that record of, you know, if account, one account rep leaves, you don't want to lose all their contacts and start over again. You want a smooth handover to the next person. Right. If you capture all that content from their communications into CRM, you're in, you're in great shape. So David, I want to get your take on something that's happening now uh, because you're so dialed into policy uh, and policy and regulations, which which is such a giant determinant of what people can and should and, and should not do with data. When you take something like COVID um, and the conversations about people going back to work and contact tracing, it's it, to me, it's like, whoa, you know, it's kind of this privacy clash against HIPAA and you know, that's, that's medical information. And yet it's, it's like this particular um, disease has been deemed um, such that it kind of falls outside uh, the traditional, you know, kind of HIPAA rules. They're not going to test me for any other ailments before I come in the door at work, but they, you know, eventually we're going to be scanning people. So. You know, the levels of complexity and dynamicism, if that's even a word, around something like that, that's even a one-off within a specific, uh, you know, kind of medical uh, data, has got to be, you know, I guess interesting and challenging, but from a policy perspective and an actual handling of that information, that's got to be a crazy challenge. Yeah, I mean, we, we do expect that COVID is going to lead to all kinds of litigation and uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. And that's a big reason why we, we saw the importance very quickly that we need a classification policy to highlight that content. So what we can do in this case is we can, first of all, identify where that content is stored. We have a product called Data Insight that can monitor your file system and quickly locate if you've got a document that includes um, you know, patient data or, or anything related to COVID-19, we can find that. And now as we bring in the communications, we can flag communications as we archive them and say this is related to COVID-19. Then when a litigation happens, you can look, you can do a quick search and you can filter on the COVID-19 tag and the people you're concerned with and the date range you're concerned with, you can easily pull in all of the communications, all of the file content, anything related to COVID-19. And this is huge for, again, for public sector where they're subject to, uh, you know, um, FINRA, I'm sorry, Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, but it's also going to affect every company because like there's going to be litigation around when a company decided that they would work from home? And did they wait too long? You know, did someone get sick because they weren't aggressive enough? There's going to be frivolous lawsuits. There's going to be, you know, more, more tangible lawsuits. And um, there's going to be all kinds of activity around how stimulus funds were spent and that sort of thing. So yeah, that's a great example of a case where you've got to find the content quickly and respond to requests very quickly. Classification can go a long way there. Yeah, that's uh, the 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 lawyers have hardly gotten involved in this COVID thing yet, and to your point, it's going to be both frivolous as well as justified. And did people come back too early? Did they take the right steps? It's um, it's going to be it's going to be messy and sloppy. But it sounds like you're in a good position to help people get through it. So you know, just kind of your final thoughts. You've been in this business for a long time. The the rate and pace of change is only increasing. The complexity. Uh, veracity, stealing some good old big data words, um, and velocity of the data is only increasing, the sources are growing exponentially. Um, 
you know, as you as you kind of sit back and reflect, obviously a lot of exciting stuff ahead, but what do you think about what gets you up in the morning um, beyond just continuing to race to keep up with the, the never ending sea of changing <laughs> regulatory environment? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think we have a great portfolio that can um, can really help us react to change and to take advantage of some of these new trends. Um, and that is exciting. Like you, uh, telemedicine, uh, the changes that come with COVID-19, you know, what we could do for telemedicine, rating doctors, gauging their performance, we could do the same sort of thing for um, teleeducation. You know, like I have two kids that uh, have had, you know, homeschooling for the last three months and uh, probably are going to face that in the fall. And um, there might be some need to just rate how the teachers are doing, how well are the you know, classes interacting and what can we learn from best practices there? So I think that's interesting, uh, an interesting space as well. But what keeps me going is the fact that we've got market leading products in archiving, e-discovery and supervision. We're putting a lot of new energy into those solutions. They've been around a long time. We've been archiving since 1998, I think, and uh, doing supervision and discovery for 20 years. And um, it's, it's strange, the market's still there, it's still expanding, it's still growing. Um, and uh, it's kind of just keeping up to change and, and trying to find better ways of surfacing the relevant commun uh, communications content. That's uh, that's kind of the key to the job, I think. Right, well, yeah, finding that signal amongst the noise is going to get increasingly more exactly. difficult and is, is, uh, has been kind of a recurring theme here over the last 12 weeks or 15 weeks or how long it's been, is you know this kind of light switch moment on digital transformation is no longer when we're going to get to it or we're going to do a POC or let's, ex let's experiment a little bit. Not, you know, here and there, it's you know, ready, set, go, whether you're ready or not, whether that's a kindergarten teacher that's never taught online, a, a, a high school teacher running a big business. Um, so nothing but a great opportunity. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. I mean, it's a very uh, changing world and uh, lots, of, uh, lots of opportunity comes with that. So. All right. Well, David, thank you for sharing your insight. Um, obviously, regulation, compliance, and uh, I like that, you know, data supervision is not just backup and recovery, is much, much bigger uh, opportunity and a lot higher value uh, activity. So congrats to you and the uh, team and thanks for the update. All right, thank you, Jeff. Thanks for the time. All righty. He's David, I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.